Well, we want to we want to say thanks again for being here. I've uh, I've got good friends of mine this morning that are videoing their messages to an empty room, and uh, and so it is nice seeing people. And uh, the 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 thought of that, I was like, oh man, that would be that would be very challenging and difficult. We're in uh, we're in week two of the road series, and uh, we're going to be traveling the next few weeks down the road of Jesus' final week of his life. And last week we were on a crowded street, and this morning. We're going to be in a borrowed room. Now, if we were all to rewind the tapes of our our lives, I think we all would have moments that really stood out to us. Moments where we kind of, you would almost call them life-altering moments, moments that shaped us, maybe even moments where time kind of stood still for us. And I probably wouldn't be alone to to say this, but for me, one of those moments was 9-11. And I'll never forget, I was in my early 20s, me and Christina had just been married just a couple years, and, and we, were, we were living at that time in the parsonage at, at the church, and, uh, a.k.a. the mouse house, and uh, it was named that for very clear reasons, because there it was, it was a, uh, what's the word, what's the word, what in a crawl space, goodness, I'm trying to think, it's a crawl space, and I'm pretty sure like a whole family, generations of families had been, uh, had been living there for a long time, uh, waiting for me to move into that, into that parsonage, and uh, it, was, it was a great time of our life, but it was in the parsonage, in the mouse house, uh, that I was there uh, on a morning watching the news, and Christine had already went to school, and whenever you saw the Twin Towers, I'd get ran into with plane. And it was, it was surreal, and I know those of you who lived through that and remember that moment, you can remember. It was, just, it was almost like it, it was just fake or a movie or as you're just watching this and, and the news reports are coming out. And, it's, and it was interesting for me in that moment, being as a follower of Jesus and even as a pastor, the feelings and emotions that I was dealing with. I don't even really knew what, I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't know what they were. And I remember going out that evening um, and just standing in my yard, and really, and, I, and this is so clear to me, I mean, I remember just looking up, there were stars in the sky, and just really praying slash crying out to God, what is going on? You know, how am I supposed to feel? How am I supposed to respond? Why would this happen? You know, all those kind of feelings and emotions that were happening to me through this event. And as I look back, I realize, and and it wasn't the last time that that has happened to me, but sometimes there are moments, there are circumstances that force us really to look inward and force us to look upward. And and this morning, we're going to be looking at a text and, and, and a situation and a moment for the disciples that really forced them to look inward. That was really a defining moment, I've got to believe, for the rest of their lives that happened in the text that we'll be in this morning. Now, we've got to understand that the disciples of Jesus, and in a very short three years, had some pretty memorable moments with Jesus. I mean, let's think about just a few of them. Feeding 5,000 with a little kid's lunch pail. I mean, you know, and they tell us it's probably around 15,000 people. I mean, that is a defining moment, seeing a stormy sea be calmed by just a few words from Jesus. Witnessing, this is one of my favorite, favorite stories, is the, the demon-possessed man who, who ran around naked and scratched himself with rocks. I mean, I'm like, you know, it's, it's Jesus' first youth group trip. He takes them there, right? And they're like, wow, no ideas, no, no ideas. Uh, but, but this guy, this guy goes from that to healed, and you see, you see these demons getting thrown in, into a herd of pigs that goes off a cliff and drowns. I mean, they had moments. They had moments. But I believe the moment that we're going to read about this morning is not just a moment that they were in awe and that they realized who Jesus was, but a moment that really forced them to look in and see who they were. And that moment is found in Matthew 26, and uh, there's Bibles underneath your seats, or if you have U version on your phone or, or tablet, you just go to live event, the verses and notes uh, will be there this morning. Matthew 26, and we're going to be starting in verse 17. Matthew 26, 17 says this, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus 
and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Now, if these instructions from Jesus that he gives to them here seem a little familiar, just last week I spoke of of instructions that he gave two of his disciples as well to go to a village ahead of them to find a donkey and her colt from someone that they don't know and take them and bring them back to him because the Lord needs them, right? And kind of the same situation here is go find a certain man, and I'm not sure who this certain man is, right? And tell him the teacher says, my appointed time is near. We, we need to crash at your place for Passover, right? And they did as, as Jesus directed them. And so here's what's interesting is we see this moment where we talked about the Passover in the city last week. That a city of about 80,000 had about 2 million people in it. So like rooms were... I'm sure not easy to come by during this week, but they have a room prepared for them. Now, before we go forward into this memorable moment of Jesus and his disciples, I want to unpack what the significance of Passover was for the Jewish people. And let's go back and talk about what Passover week was all about. Because some of you may be like, I don't even know what this reference is. So let's rewind about 1,200 years from the time that we're reading about to a time in history when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And some of you have heard this story before. Some of you, some of you know the story because of the Prince of Egypt. Uh, you've seen that movie, right? Some of you know this story because Charleston Heston. You've seen, you've seen that movie, right? But for us to fully appreciate about what's going on here with Jesus and the guys that we find in the borrowed room, we need to rewind a bit. The Israelites have been slaves to the Egyptians for more than 400 years when this guy named Moses shows up on the scene. And God chooses Moses to be one through whom God would deliver his people. He tells Moses to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and tell him, this is what the Lord of God Israel has said, let my people go. And so Moses goes and he says, this is what the Lord God of Israel has said, let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, no. And ten times this conversation takes place, and each time that Pharaoh refused to listen to God, God shows up to let Pharaoh know who is in charge. He sends plagues down on the Egyptians every time that Pharaoh refuses. Their water turns to blood. They were infested with frogs, gnats, locusts, flies. Their livestock died. There was thunder and hell, boils and darkness over the land for three days. And still, what is Pharaoh saying? No. Until the tenth and final plague, an angel of death would visit in the night, and the firstborn son in every household would die. And so the Lord gave instructions to Moses and Aaron to tell the entire community of Israel to take a lamb, one-year-old male, a perfect one without defect, and take care of it for four days. And then the entire community of Israel must slaughter the lamb at twilight and then put the blood of the lamb and place it over the doorposts of their homes. And then eat a meal together. The Lord calls the lamb the Passover lamb. He says in Exodus 12, 13, we read this, But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. And that is exactly what the Israelites did. And in the morning in every household in Egypt, there was either a dead son or a dead lamb. And Pharaoh, losing his firstborn son, finally stops saying no and says, go, get out of here. And God delivered his people from bondage. And they began their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. Then God told them after that to commemorate that deliverance by celebrating year after year, generation after generation, a Passover meal where a lamb would be slain to remember how they were saved and how they were passed over. Because of the blood of the lamb. And they did, year after year, generation after generation. And about 1,200 years later, on this road that we're traveling, Jesus, the Lamb of God, and his disciples would share this Passover meal together for the last time in an upstairs room they borrowed for the night. Verse 20 of Matthew 26. 
It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now, I don't know if you have a friend who's a conversation killer. You know, one that like you're having a great moment and somebody says something that they, you're like, what did you just do? You just kind of pulled the pin of the grenade and threw it in there and just killed the night. I'm not saying Jesus did that here because he's perfect. But he did throw a little curveball here to the table when, when, he, when he said that, right? When he says, one of you will betray me. Now, just to get the full depth and breadth of this moment, we need to understand what happened prior to this moment. And we find through John's account in John chapter 13 that Jesus, wanting to show the full extent of his love for them, wrapped a towel around his waist, put water in a basin, and washed their feet. I mean, you know, you think about someone you truly admire, someone that that has poured into you, someone that you would trust with your life. Have that moment, wrap a towel around their waist, get on a knee, and, and really show that they are serving you like that. They just had that moment with Jesus. They just had that moment together with each other. And then Jesus says, one of you will betray me. Now, can you imagine the awkwardness of that moment? Can you imagine the silence? Can you imagine everyone kind of looking around the room, suspicious of who in the world is the one that is going to betray Jesus? You know, many times when we we read through the scriptures, we just keep rolling verse to verse and just keep reading. But I can assure you that for those guys in that room, there was no rolling through. They had stopped in their tracks in that moment. Now, for us, it's easy, it's easy to say because we know how the story unfolds, right? But for them, they have no idea. And, and, and we're going to see evidence of that as we read forward in verse 22. It says, they were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other. Think about this. I mean, this is crazy. One after other, they said to him, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. I mean, again, we know how it unfolded. They didn't. Matthew says they were sad. They were, I'm sure they were perplexed. I'm sure they were, they were confused. They had all these moments together of solidarity with one another. And Jesus, one of us is going to betray you. Surely not I, Lord. It's not me, is it? John 13, 22 says this. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Why would they ask that? Why would they each ask that? Maybe they were just incredibly curious and thought maybe by the process of elimination they could figure out who it was, right? Maybe maybe they just want other, they wanted others to hear Jesus clear their name, maybe. Maybe that if they could find out who it was, they could stop him. Or maybe just maybe And this is what I believe. They knew that there is a betrayer lurking in all of us. Maybe they knew that they were capable of doing some of the darkest things imaginable, even betraying Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, they know we are all capable capable of saying, thinking, and doing some of the darkest things imaginable. And we are, aren't we? All of us. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. I I am sure they all had quick flashbacks to past failures, situations when they lacked judgment, self-control, discernment, times maybe when they were less than godly, moments when they regressed and embarrassed themselves. And in this moment thinking, I have that capacity, right? Moments that they think back where maybe where pride and, and lust just flowed through their life and came out in words and responses and actions. You see, when I hear them say, surely it's not I, Lord, I'm thinking this, that they had a very, very good pulse on who they were and what they were capable of. You know, in 2012, I uh, started something called CrossFit. And um, I mean, I tell you, I was, I'm, I'm actually, I'm so out of shape right now, by the way. Let's, I'm just throwing it out there. This is accountability, so maybe I'll get better in the upcoming weeks. Uh, I'm serious. Uh, it's, it's driving me nuts. But anyway, 2012, I was there too. And, uh, 
And I was like, I need something to like shock my system. Like I'm one of those where I can't do like some like, you know, like kind of meandering slow. I need something to like I'm jumping all in, ice cold water kind of thing. That's where I need to be, right? And so I started doing this and it was it was far more than I wanted. I mean, I'll be honest. And it was actually as a guy, it was a guy that owned the gym at the time that he was in my small group when I was, when I was in high, as a youth pastor. And that's, I mean, that's how I got connected. And, and the CrossFit usually has like a strength component. And then there's like a workout, like, a, I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 15 minute workout where you're doing like reps of something. And I remember early on as I'm working out, and let's just say there were, you know, there were 15 reps involved in what we were doing. I remember the coach always saying, don't shave reps. Every rep counts. And, and I remember the whole shaving reps deal. I'm like, I, I had to ask him, I'm like, what does that mean? Why are you saying that? Don't shave reps. And he goes, because here's the deal. There, there are people that will not do, if it says 15 reps, they will do 12. Or they will do 11. I'm like, that is the craziest thing ever. Why would you not do all your reps? And then I got in a workout. And then I realized, as dumb as it is, as dumb as it is, in a workout, you're at rep 10 or 11, and you're thinking to yourself, no one will notice. <laughs> I mean, what's the matter? Who cares? I mean, I can roll. Let's, 11 is as good as 15 to me. I mean, you know, I mean, every, every culture tells me my truth is truth, right? So, you know, whatever, right? Uh, so, no, I mean, so you get in that place and you're like, you, you see the temptation to cheat in the dumbest of things. Like, I'm getting no awards for this. It is not going to do anything for me to get, you know, a time 10 seconds faster than a time I would have got if I did the reps. But here's what's funny is I look, look at that in CrossFit, and, and I'll just tell you, to this day, you still have those moments. And I've got some of my, my people I work out with in here. You still have moments where you're like, I'd rather not do the rest of those reps. I'd rather just roll on. But here's what I learned in that is that in that goofy thing, I realize my sinful and selfish capacity through reps in CrossFit, right? And it, re- and it makes me recognize that there is a betrayer in me. There is a betrayer in me. And if it's in me doing CrossFit, it's in me in all areas of my life. And here, here is what I'm trying to learn. The more I'm able to understand my own heart, the more I'm able to bump up against my own sinful capacity, the more I examine my life and I examine my motives, the more I understand my sinful potential, the more I, can, the more I understand what I could become, what I could do. When I am able to embrace that, listen, when I, I, it is easier for me to be able to not only embrace Jesus, but understand who I could be and who I, who I will, will become if Jesus is not the center of my life. See, here's what's funny about this is, and I'll just speak for myself, it's very easy for me to confront it and see it in other people, and it's very difficult to confront it and see it in my own life. We're really good at seeing it in everyone else. I mean, I'm sure we could all say, well, yeah, so-and-so has this, this, and this happening, Right? But what this text is saying is, will we confront our own lives? Will we confront our own hearts? Will we refuse the distractions and the noise that we allow in our lives to prevent us from seeing our own lives? Now, here's, here's what I'm learning. When I fool and deceive myself, this is what happens. Then I betray myself. Then I betray the instructions and the truth that God has given me. So when I fool myself to not really see the reality of my heart and the motives of my heart, then I end up betraying myself because of how God has created me to live and the life he's given me. And ultimately, I will turn my back on the desires, the plans, and the truth that God has for me. You know, I have a friend who always tells me, what you don't know about yourself will destroy you. And and what he's saying is, you need to get acquainted with your heart. You need to understand your blind spots. You need to understand your sinful capacity. Not to excuse it, by the way. Not to perpetuate it, by the way. Not to minimize it or justify it. But to know it. Why? Because when I know it, I recognize that I need a solution far greater than me. 
I need, a, I need an answer far greater than me. When I realize my own sinful potential, I also get this. I also express grace to others in abundance. When I don't understand who I am and who I can become, guess what? There's not a lot of grace coming out of my life. There's not a lot of grace. There's a lot of legalism. There's a lot of self-righteousness coming out of my life. When I realize what lurks within, it is much easier for me to have a posture of humility before God and before others. So here's the question. When was the last time you confronted the reality of your own heart? Seriously, like when's the last time you really looked within? When was the last time that you were still before God? And we've talked a lot in the the prayer series just about being silent. When's the last time you were quiet enough for God to speak to you and for you to be able to bump up against the things that maybe aren't so pleasant or holy in your life? And the last question is this, do you recognize the betrayer that lurks inside of you? Verse 23, Matthew 26, says, Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi, which is crazy. Jesus answered, You have said so. And so he's like, So is it me, Lord? Yes. (laughs) Right? Yes, it is you. You know, Romans 3.23 we read, For all sin and fallen short of the glory of God. I want you to listen to verse 24 and 25 of that text. It says, Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. I love that. God, with undeserved kindness, declares you and I not guilty. Not by anything we have done, by the way. And only by his love, only by his sacrificial death, only by the blood of Jesus, the Passover lamb. Here's the thing that I've learned, uh, and I've grown up in, in the Bible Belt culture, is that it is very easy for us to think that there are different things, and we would never publicly say this. I think we, we just believe this. There are different ways for us to be accepted by Christ, different ways for us to be in relationship with Christ. And, and for some, it's, it's church attendance. You know, for some, it's my grandmother's faith. You know, for some, it's my, my dad's faith. For some, it's just merits and achievements and, and being a good person. And, and what I love about this text and this topic is that here's the deal. The betrayer inside of all of us, our good deeds, our church attendance, I mean, us on our best day is not enough right? That it takes a solution and a person far greater than grandma's faith or my, or my ability to memorize scripture, right? It takes something greater than that. It takes the blood of a lamb, the Passover lamb, Jesus. We are created to need a savior. There is depravity and darkness in all of us that cannot be solved or figured out beyond the blood of Christ. And so what we realize is it was so much more 1,200 years prior than the blood of a lamb on the doorpost. It was so much more than just an escape from Egypt, right? It was about this real freedom that would be bought with the blood of the lamb 1,200 years later from the Messiah, Jesus himself. Now, for some of you, I want you to think about this personally because, I, again, I think we get kind of immune and a little bit numb to some of these words and terminology. Have you thought about Jesus dying for you? I mean, him sacrificing his life for you, like for your sin, for that that hidden area of your life where there's that dark and sinful capacity. Do you know that he did this for you? Not not from a historical or, or theological perspective, but for you personally. Have you looked at the cross and ever asked the question, am I the one, Lord? Am I the one? Did my sin put you there? Is this forgiveness truly for me? And the answer on both accounts is yes, you are the one. I am the one. Your sin, my sin, yes. He died on our behalf for that. And forgiveness is for all of us. 
Verse 26 of Matthew 26 says this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. You see, at a Passover meal, there was always a presider, someone to explain the Passover meal. And it was customary for that person to take the bread and say this, this is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the wilderness. So that everyone eating the bread would remember how their ancestors had suffered so that they could be free. But Jesus does not say that. And I wonder, I'm sure, I wonder if the guys in the room thought that he was getting it wrong. Like somebody like Peter's probably like, I need to correct him because he's doing this whole thing wrong. He obviously hasn't trained where I've trained, right? Uh, Because this is what Jesus says, this is my body. This is the bread of my affliction. And so for years as people, we've eaten this supper. This is how Jesus is saying, we've eaten this supper on the night that God redeemed us and brought us from under Pharaoh's bondage, but tonight... We are going to eat this supper on the night before God delivers all people once and for all. And this bread represents my body through which I am going to bring you out of a greater bondage, sin. And I'm sure that they were trying to figure it out fully in the moment, a little bit perplexed by everything going on. And then he says this in verse 27. Then he took a cup, Jesus And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, I can imagine his disciples sensing the weight of this moment are probably silently and suddenly drawn in a little bit. They see their Lord and closest friend pause as he stares into this red liquid. The room had to feel a sense of power and holiness as Jesus began to speak. I I imagine he looked at each of them in the eye, which I believe he looks at each one of you in the eye right now, and he says, this is the cup of the covenant. Now, for many of us who've been around the church for a while, we associate this phrase, the cup of the covenant, covenant, with communion. We've heard it so many times before, but what Jesus' disciples would have instantly thought of was the betrothal ceremony during a wedding, which makes me wonder if some of his disciples probably were, were stifled a little bit and had a confused smile as he was beginning to say this because it just didn't necessarily fit. It was in a different context. It's, it's what he was doing and what he was referring to is the cultural, cultural equivalent of Jesus getting down on one knee with a ring box. And that's the kind of passionate and powerful expression of Jesus' love that he wanted to make sure that he would communicate to them. God in human form, about to be brutally tortured and killed for all of mankind. And he, in that moment, his final moment with his followers, could not think of a better way and a stronger way to communicate his love for them other than through this image of marriage. The power of deep, sacrificial covenant. So Jesus, the bridegroom, took the cup. And I couldn't help but think as I was reading over this this week, he spilled it on purpose. He poured out his blood on purpose. It was no accident. Had Judas never gone to the high priest, Jesus still would have gone to the cross. This was not an unfortunate detour in a good man's life right? This was the plan. He was the Passover lamb. John 10, 18, I love it, says, Jesus says this, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. He spilled it on purpose. This is why he came. His death is central, the most climatic moment in the history of the world. All the history of the people of God had been pointing to this moment. Every deliverance, every return from exile, every freedom from a tyrant, every Passover meal, every lamb that had been slain had been pointing to Jesus in this moment. And this man passing a cup of wine around the table in a borrowed room on this night confirmed that. Now, for us, covenants don't mean as much as they did to them. But for them, covenants were a big, big deal. Covenants were not to be broken. And traditionally, at the Passover, there were four 
cups of wine at the Passover meal to remember the four promises, the four covenants that God made with the Israelites. He said to Moses in Exodus 6, 6 and 7, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. The four covenants that were represented by the four cups of wine were I will bring you out, I will free you, I will redeem you, and I will take you. And so Jesus takes just one cup of wine and says, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. This is my blood, one cup, one act of sacrifice for all time. By my blood, I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you. And I wonder, I really do wonder this morning, which of those promises of that covenant do you need to hear from God today? Through the blood of Christ, he is saying to you and to I this morning, I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you. And I know for us, you know, I, a lot of times we, we think of things that seal, seal covenants or promises. You know, you got like a, a pinky promise moment or, a, you know, cross my heart and hope to die. You know, all that, that kind of stuff or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I even think of a, a wedding ring. I mean, this is, you know, this is a, a really a, a confirmation, an affirmation of a promise and a, a vow that has been made. But let me tell you something. None of those are even close to the confirmation of a covenant that comes through someone shedding their blood on behalf to put his stamp, his life stamp on the covenant and the promise that was given. And he is saying to you this morning, I will bring you out, out of whatever kind of bondage you may be living in. And some of you here this morning, you're like, I'm stuck. <laughs> I don't know if I can stop this or that. I don't know if I'll ever get out. It's a dead end. You may even be here this morning. You think there's no hope. And Jesus, through the shedding of his blood, says, you're wrong. I will bring you out. And he also says, I will free you. And some of you are here this morning, and you want to be free from being a slave to sin. You want to be free from addiction. You want to be free maybe from insecurity or rejection or unforgiveness or bitterness or guilt. And you're like, I don't know that I can. And Jesus says, listen, this isn't some weak peaky promise. I have shown it through the shedding of my blood. I can free you. I will free you. And for may, maybe some of you, it's like, you know what? I need redemption. And Jesus is saying, I will redeem you. I will buy back every wrongdoing. I will buy back every injustice done to you or things that you have done to others as well. You think there's no way. You think you're, you're too far gone. You're wrong. And I'll show you how you're wrong. I will shed my blood on your behalf. I will redeem you. I will buy it back. Maybe some of you here this morning, you need to hear, I will take you. You've faced a lot of rejection. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's through circumstances in life. And you're just like, there's no way in the world that God would take me. There's no way in the world that God would bring me in as his son or daughter. There's no way. And Jesus, again, by the cross, through the blood that was shed, through him being the ultimate Passover lamb, he says, you are wrong, you are worth it, you are valuable, you are chosen, you are loved, you are mine, and my blood says so. This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and you, and I have poured it out for you. So this morning as we close, we're going to have an opportunity to bump up against the Passover lamb through communion. And maybe, maybe it's one of those statements, those truths, those covenant promises that God is giving to you that you really need to latch on to when taking communion. Or maybe when you take communion this morning, you need, to, you need to go before God and say, is it I, Lord? Is it me? You know, what is in me that needs to be exposed? What is in me that your light and grace needs to shine on? And so my hope and prayer as we have a moment together is that you would have the courage and the focus and the commitment to really stare in the eyes of the man who confirmed his covenant promise through the shedding of his blood, 
And I promise you, if you do that, you will walk out of this place changed and transformed because of what he did on your behalf. God, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for for an opportunity to gather. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to, to be grateful and thankful for what you've done for us. God, help, help the terms that we throw around not to be cliche for us. Help them not to be bumper stickers. God, help them to hit our hearts this morning. And so, God, you are the Passover lamb for us. You shed your blood for us, for the forgiveness of sins, for our redemption, for our freedom, for our adoption. And so, God, we just ask, Lord, that you would, you would just change us right now. Help us to sense it. Help us to, to really feel the weight of what was done on our behalf. God, help us to examine our hearts this morning as we go before the communion table. Help us to know who we are know who you are. God, we thank you, Lord. We give you this time. We pray that you'd be glorified through communion. In Jesus' name.